again, this, this is co-branded by the Lancet Countdown, um, the Canadian Medical Association and the Canadian Public Health Association. So last year, fantastic support from the Canadian uh, Public Health Association. Again, this year, and super, super key. So as Ian was saying, heat is the big story uh, internationally and in Canada this year. So, um, you know, we're, we're a cold country and I live in Yellowknife. So my first interview <laughs> was on CBC radio with the with the morning host in Yellowknife. And I was like, heat's a problem. Quite <laughs> <laughs> right, right, cool. Um, but we did have 90 heat-related deaths in uh, Quebec uh, this past summer. And it's interesting, what, what I find super interesting about this um, indicator is how um, recent the baseline is compared to uh, the period we're comparing it to. So the baseline that they were using is from 1986 to 2008, and that actually overlaps with the study period, um, which is from 2000 to 2017. So, I mean, I know we're in a uh, university, so there's many young people here, but many of us were alive for this entire period. And so what this is actually showing is that even in Canada, you know, a circumpolar nation, our vulnerable people um, have been, are exposed to a 0.2 degree Celsius increase in temperature over that time. So to me, you know, that's that's pretty incredible that we're seeing those impacts. Um, and so what we found, and you know, doing uh, speaking with people yesterday in Ottawa, was that uh, Quebec had a really good system for um, tracking heat-related deaths. But people in Ottawa were experiencing similar heat, and there weren't any numbers associated with that. And so what we were what we're suggesting in this recommendation is standardization of the epidemiologic surveillance across the country, so that we're gathering same numbers in the same way um, across the country. So, because once we have numbers, we know that what gets studied gets acted upon, and so that way that will help us uh, with resource allocation as we're trying to help our public health units do things like uh, make sure that our vulnerable elderly who may be in an apartment up three flights of stairs, potentially with limited mobility and having trouble accessing water, are, are the people that we really target for support in addition to our homeless people who may need the provision of public shelters for cooling and those types of inter interventions. And the other recommendation, um, and, and George Kitching is actually here from the CFMS, he'll also be on the panel. I think it was like not quite a long enough table so we didn't get a um, a, a placard, and same with uh, Katie Hayes, who will be who's here to talk about uh, mental health impacts of climate change. So, Canadian medical students, um, when the CFMS did a survey of outgoing medical students, and I think it was 2014 or was it 2015? 2014. So, not a single one of them had this in their curriculum. So, as James mentioned, we've known that this is one of the biggest public health threats of the 21st century ever since 2009. So, you know, we're, we're almost 10 years later and the students are still telling me that this isn't in their curriculum. So the CFMS, uh, Canadian Federation of Medical Students, um, and George can speak to this, um, has actually launched an initiative to have this get a foothold in medical education in every university in Canada by 2020. So, you know, the, and they're gonna keep track of it and they're gonna grade it and we're gonna po post grades on the internet. Um, and then we're going to do it again the next year and again the next year. And what we're looking to see is ever greater integration of climate change and health into all aspects of the Canada's curricula. And this has actually, to the credit of Canadian med students, and I want to mention Claudel Tetrain-Delvier, who um, has really been a leader internationally and actually wrote the uh, World Health Organization's manual on climate change and health um, for med students and who was lead, one of the leaders of the International Federation of Medical Students Associations. And uh, she hosted their big international conference in Montreal in the summer and had me speak. And uh, we actually checked with the IFMSA and the CFMS um, initiative was consistent with their policy. So the International Federation of Medical Students Associations now has picked this up this initiative. So we're gonna do our very best to bring um, essentially the organizing savvy uh, that we can we can access with people who are excellent at online organizing and you know mailing lists like what I, what I've learned from my advocacy biz as as the sort of tools of the trade how do you organize humans electronically and how do you distribute the, the materials that people need on the ground to create change at the local level um, so we're going to do that internationally within Canada to really support med students so they're not the lonely voice at their institution trying to create change so I really invite everybody in this room to be part of that initiative and to help sort of get your sharp elbows up around the curriculum tables. And we'll uh, talk to, and you know, it's just been such a pleasure working with these, uh, these med students. Um, 
when I was at the IFMSA meeting, Claudel said, we're too young to know what's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently she was quoting Nick Watts, uh, my current boss uh, at The Lancet. So it's amazing what people get done when they don't know what's impossible. <laughs> and you know, so just put, put, put the impossibilities in your back pocket and just act as though you can do it, is, is what I've learned from the MSU. So it's important to take a look at, uh, at, at what we're not doing particularly well at Canada. So in writing the, the UK brief, or helping to write it, I learned that in the UK they decreased greenhouse gas emissions by um, 41% between 1990 and 2016. In Canada, ours went up by 100 megatons. So we started at 603 megatons and it went up to 704. And we had like a teensy tiny decrease since then. So we're simply not getting the job done. So this, this Climate Change Act that we were talking about that has a 10th anniversary, 10th birthday this week that's being celebrated um, was, is something I think we could look at. So they had multi-party engagement 10 years ago. They passed this act. The act sets out um, with quite a long timeline every five years um, a policy target and it's legislated in terms of the greenhouse gas reduction. So everybody knows where we're going. Everybody's on board, and they also have an independent scientific advisory council that evaluates existing policies to see if what's been planned matches up with where they're trying to go. Um, and it lets them know, look, you know, your basket of policy interventions isn't enough. You're going to need to do more. And and they manage, you know, through this to do an incredible job of saving our coal and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And I think it's something that we can really look to. Um, so yeah, we are. You can see that our uh, target for 2030 is uh, 523 megatons, and we're you know kind of best case scenario right now, according to the Auditor General, um, thinking of probably in the upper around 697. So we have work to do. And as physicians, you know, I, moving back and forth between uh, social determinants of health, uh, social justice part of medicine, and the ecological determinants of health community, sometimes our our language doesn't intersect all that well. Um, and you know we're guilty of that within uh, the ecological determinants of health and climate change and health community. So when I was at COP21 last year and I was sitting in on all the uh, CAN uh, Climate Action Network uh, meetings, and there's some people that I know uh, from that community here, we were talking a lot about just transition um, and about how we can support fossil fuel workers as they transition to uh, a new economy. And it struck me that really that was something that was really missing from uh, the conversation that we were having around climate change and health. And it deserves our active support. Um, it, it, it requires our active support. So in, in climate change and health, we need to be talking just as much about the social determinants of health as, as the people in the social determinants of health need to be talking about uh, the ecological determinants of health, because it's all all, all part of one uh, set of health determinants, and, and otherwise we'll find ourselves working against one another. So our recommendation here, um, and I'll just go through to here, is to uh, increase ambition in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution in Canada, and to twin this with an ambition, uh, emphasis on just transition policies to support an equitable transition for people who work in this fossil fuel industry as the uh, economy transforms. And so just going back to this slide, some of the really interesting data that the uh, International Countdown group put together this year was uh, uh, premature mortality from anthropogenic fine particulate air pollution with source attribution, which is pretty neat because we, we sometimes, uh, other, other groups have calculated this, this mortality, but we don't often see where it's coming from. And so what I think is of interest particularly on this slide, I like to look at at places we can do something about. So what are the policy targets here? So coal is responsible for about uh, 450 deaths out of this total. And you know this is something we can be proud of in Canada. We do have a commitment to phase out unabated coal power by 2030. And our government has put quite a bit of um, oomph behind that and have in fact leveraged that policy into leadership joined with the UK um, to co-found the Powering Pass Coal Alliance, which now has 60 national and subnational members and you know they wanted Nick Watts to present actually at the uh, um, launch of it last year at COP but he's left town so they got me um, but what you know and of course that's an extremely humbling experience but what that showed me is how important it is to have the voice of health at the table because it meant something to the I could see that it meant something to the policymakers to have somebody who I had a puffer in my pocket 
you know, and so I sort of pulled the puffer out. I was like, this is about decreasing asthma exacerbations. This is about more kids having more time at school. This is about less healthcare costs. And I could see heads nodding. And so that tells me that we need to be in these spaces and that our voice there makes a difference because what I'm finding is that in the environmental community, particularly if, you know, in, at the COP level, um, the conference of the parties, the climate change negotiations, they're still not talking in health language. They're really speaking um, about CO2. And there are tons we can, so much we can learn from energy analysts there. And I think things that we can contribute. So the second target that I think is really interesting here is um, uh, land-based transport. So it is responsible for about a thousand um, air pollution or PM 2.5 related deaths. And it's also responsible uh, for 25% of, of our national greenhouse gas emissions. So this is a place where we really can uh, put some elbow grease behind and have a great double impact in terms of decreasing deaths from air pollution and also decreasing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So a couple things that we've looked at, uh, one of the recommendations from last year's report with the CPHA was to support a national active transportation strategy. Um, and since then, about 150 NGOs have signed on to a, an initiative around that, and it's certainly something that's on Catherine McKenna's radar. So as a health community, that's something that we can be talking about and pulling together to try to, try to make happen. Um, the other thing that is interesting was also in last year's report is telehealth. So some of this transport comes from healthcare. So Trevor Hancock, who's really the ecological determinist guru at the CPHA, that was what he really wanted to see in last year's report. And certainly there's been some studies that show that, you know, if you increase telehealth, and one of them was actually done in, in Ontario, um, you know, it decreased patient time put into their, their consultation, it decreases, the, you know, the amount that they have to travel, it decreases costs hugely for healthcare systems, which are often trying to reimburse people for those costs. And, uh, you know, there's less chance of somebody getting in a car accident and less greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we're, we're trialing this where I live up in uh, Yellowknife, as you can imagine, our transport times and costs are huge. So I had my first patient the other day, actually, where I was trying to figure out if they had Bell's palsy or a stroke. And sort of me and my colleagues were like peering at the camera like this. <laughs> Is your forehead moving? I'm not sure if her forehead's moving or not. Do you think her forehead's moving? <laughs> and uh, we, we couldn't figure out if her forehead was moving or not. So, so she did come. And uh, she was like, oh, you're the scary doctor from the video. <laughs> and, you know, I, I was like, I'm not that scary. I'm like, and she's like, no, it wasn't that bad. But, you know, so it's like a process where you know that, you know, there's going to be time for us to get used to it. But I think there's tremendous potential because later that day, as the bells progressed, she, her forehead wasn't working at all. And we could have made that diagnosis had she presented two hours later. So, you know, there, there's definitely... Um, potential for this, and that's actually a big focus of uh, the CNA's innovation R and Jewel is to support telehealth kinds of activities, which is great. So the uh, second uh, recommendation there is to um, to get rid of those forward data deaths, to phase out coal-powered electricity in Canada by 2030 or sooner, um, and it makes a difference where we move to there with a minimum of two-thirds of the power replaced by non-emitting sources and any gap made up by um, really efficient natural gas technology in a system where we really try to uh, tighten up all those methane leaks because right now we're losing a heck of a lot of methane into the atmosphere and that's a really big problem uh, because methane has about 84 times the greenhouse gas warming potential of CO2 over a 20 year time interval and 20 year, the 20 year time interval is the one we really care about at this particular moment. So looking at financial incentives, so I'm not gonna talk too much about carbon pricing. So it was hard to make a fun picture for carbon pricing. <laughs> so I think that sort of demonstrates, that's a case study in why this is a difficult policy to convince people uh, about, you know? Like how do we make carbon pricing cool? Um, I was actually recruited into some of this by an economist who wanted me to present with him. So up in NWT we have people who live at the end of long long highways and have time to think. So Doug Ritchie is kind of like, you know, I, I feel like an idiot trying to make the case for carbon pricing because I'm an economist and I don't have science training, so how about we present together? So I used to go and I would give the health presentation and I would like totally depress the audience because it was terrifying. And then I'd be like, here's Doug. And then Doug would come on and be like, this is the best solution. And it actually worked really well. So I think that's the kind of thing that, that will actually benefit from. And we're really backed up on that by st statements uh, by the Lancet, which is a huge multidisciplinary group, um, like this one. Uh, so the single most powerful strategic instrument to inoculate human health against the risks of climate change would be for governments to introduce strong and sustained carbon pricing in the ways pledged 
to strengthen over time until the problem is brought under control. And they go on to compare this to what we've done with tobacco. So we know that, you know, we've, we've done a really great trial of trying to solve climate change by, like, good people making better decisions more often. I say that trial's done, right? We've been doing that since I was a kid. Doesn't work. Individual action isn't going to figure this out. So we need systematic, systemic change, and we need collective action to get us to where we want to go. And the single most important tool by the people who have done the research is carbon pricing. So the Canadian Medical Association supports this. The, the Canadian Public Health Association is really putting a lot of emphasis behind supporting this federally. And uh, it deserves our support. We need to start framing climate change in terms of health and framing this, framing carbon pricing in terms of a treatment for health, uh, for the health emergency of climate change. And we need to engage with the media to do that. So part of what I love about the Alliance at Countdown project is, you know, I am on the steering committee of the Planetary Health Alliance. We have a lot of conversations about how do we connect academia and policy? Um, because there's still this real stigma about the activist academic. Um, and I know that this is something like we dance around still um, at the countdown, like making sure that we're not being too advocacy oriented, uh, you know, sort of that. So the data policy advocacy chain is what we need to get really good at. We need to create the relationships that will allow us to do that. And then we further need to get really good at communicating uh, at the end. So I spent yesterday, uh, supported by the Canadian Medical Association, basically getting trotted around Ottawa by extremely organized humans with really good connections to media who essentially just said, okay, we are going here to talk to this person and she works for this group and she's interested in this and now you have 15 minutes because we have to be over there. And I was just like, oh, you know. I have never done anything like that before in my life. But that, that is what it takes to, you'll see that there's a lot of media today, that is what it takes. So we need to find those humans and make sure that that kind of thing happens more often because the lobbyists do that. So if we're not doing that, we're not gonna win this. And so one of the recommendations is to, in order to help people make these links between climate change and health in the media, to start to issue statements about it. So the Canadian Association of Medical or uh, Physicians for the Environment did that this summer around the heat wave and also around the wildfire. And we got a lot of interest around that because if we're not doing that, um, people won't make those connections. So we need trusted health bodies and voices to start saying, okay, so you might not be able to make attribution for an individual heat wave, but what you can say is, we know that climate change is increasing heat across the globe and human exposure to heat, as has been demonstrated by you know, one of the largest research collaboratives in the world. This heat wave that we're seeing now in Quebec, which has eight, you know, 90 heat related deaths associated with it, is the kind of thing we are going to see more of as the world warms, and so we need to make sure that we're preparing for that. So you don't need to say this heat wave is due to climate change because we know everything is multifactorial, but you can certainly make those links in a way that is useful, and we need to do that every single time. And so this is, um, we were invited to do a case study if we wanted to um, as part of this. So mental health is one thing that the uh, countdown doesn't yet have an um, indicator on because the evidence base is still in development and it's difficult to make, um, it's difficult to find data that is worldwide on it right now. And that's kind of what's required to create an indicator of the countdown. So they're, they're trying to work it in in different ways. The Australian countdown report does have some mental health in it, and there's a little box in, in the countdown that talks about it. But I wanted to talk about what some of the research that's really been done in Canada. So we know that uh, climate change um, related sort of disasters are certainly associated with evacuations, post-traumatic stress disorder, potentially associated anxiety. We know that uh, heat waves, recent research shows, may increase suicidality in people. Uh, there may be a, all these stressors can do things like increased drug and uh, alcohol abuse. <coughs> but what we've really studied a lot in Canada is actually the impact on our really uh, our populations who live really close to the land. So where I live, um, you know, I serve a majority Indigenous population as a, a emergency doctor in Yellowknife, and many of my patients still get a large proportion of their healthy lean protein from land-based food. So from, from hunting, and that requires often, you know, knowing when the ice is gonna be stable and when it's gonna be safe, and so they notice when the ice is no longer stable and safe. Like, I've, I've definitely, you know, stitched up my share of a scalp laceration for people who are trying to go on the snow machine across a, uh, a river, and then the river, well, the ice collapsed, and they kind of got catapulted across, and, you know, they end up with this big ice shard making a big, um, 
job laceration, you talk to them about it, say, you know, I've been crossing that river at that time of year my entire life, you know, this is a real change, we're noticing real changes in the environment. And so those changes have food security impacts, but they also have impacts on mental health because all of a sudden your per permafrost slopes are actually destabilizing. If you get melting permafrost right at the bottom of a hill, the whole hill can slide down. So those are called, a technical term for that is a permafrost slump, and they're well demonstrated. And so your elders from the, the high Arctic will say, you know, there weren't any landslides when I was little, and now there's landslides all over the place. So can you imagine if you lived in a place and you were attuned to the environment because you depended on it for survival, um, and then that environment just started to change around you? So that's very disconcerting. Um, and so the term for that is soul nostalgia, or feeling homesick when you're still at home. And what we also found is that the study that uh, James and I and Ashley Consulo um, did in Yellowknife, so there's a quantitative component to it, so we found that there was double the number of asthma exacerbations associated with this. And this is over a two and a half month study period, so I'm not talking a like two week long smoke exposure, I'm talking mid June to the end of August. And we also did um, community-based interviews with uh, the Yellowknife Denny and the Kakatu First Nation who are very impacted as well as Yellowknifers. And people told us essentially that it sucked. <laughs> and so the people were, because the public health advice, as we know, is to stay inside with the windows and doors closed when it's smoky. That works great when your smoke exposure is four days long. But when it's most of the summer, you can imagine what that does to people. So people essentially, uh, you know, they felt sad, they felt lonely. Uh, there was a theme around reduction in physical activity because we, you know, they weren't able to go outside because we were telling them to go and exercise outside. And the problem with that is that, you know, we're increasingly giving exercise prescriptions as doctors. So we know that exercise improves mood. So we will prescribe it for everything from, you know, improving blood, blood sugar control and diabetes to improving mood. Um, and so now all of a sudden, not only were they actually inside and having cabin fever, but they were losing the treatment effect of the exercise that they had been previously getting. And so it magnified the mental health impact. Um, people also felt disconnected from the land, that they were unable to do the berry picking and the food gathering that they usually do. And they felt, many of them, they placed this in the larger context of the changing climate and were like, is this what I have to expect all the time now? Um, what does this mean for my kids? And certainly I have a five-year-old and in her life, she has seen significant smoke or fire for out of her five summers. So started with that one and then we almost got evacuated from a campground and she saw like flames on a hill and then we've had two summers at my favorite lake that I grew up with, you know, in, down in the Okanagan, super, super smoky. So our kids are growing up in a different place than we're growing up and it does make me worried and it does make me wonder, you know, you know, it makes me want to work really hard at this, which is why I do. But you can just see how this feels, okay? So this is an air quality health index of 10 plus. Imagine looking out at that for most of the summer. Um, and this is what people in BC and Alberta were, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much done. This is what people in BC and Alberta were uh, experiencing this summer. And so actually we, we did a ton of media around our, our study um, in BC and Alberta in uh, August. And so I think the most important message about this is that it's okay if climate change makes you feel sad. That's normal. Um, I often get people coming up to me after presentations saying, I thought I was the only person who felt like that. No, this is super normal. And uh, something that Ashley Consulo points out is that there is a we creating potential for us to having these conversations. Us drawing together and sharing those feelings is something that can help us create the community that James was talking about and move forward to the productive collective action that we know that we need to change the system in order to change the climate. So I just encourage you to be open with those feelings with your friends and family, you know, to seek community if you need it. And what I've certainly found is that action feels better than anxiety. And I think not only is that how we're going to get things done, but it's how we're going to feel better too. Well, that's a pretty powerful presentation. And uh, it's kind of interesting to sort of walk up and feel like the heavy. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm going to just now ask Sandy Buckman uh, to, uh, to, to come to the podium. Sandy is the uh, president-elect of the Canadian Medical Association. Um, he's a, uh, a professor at the University of Toronto in the Department of Family and Community Medicine. Um, 
he has a long, long history uh, of really understanding from a deeply clinical and practical perspective uh, the issues that some of the most marginalized uh, and, and poor and neglected people in our country face, um, designing clinical services for those people, uh, and then engaging in um, the political process of institution building and bringing those issues into an institution and making it part of what that organization or institution does in terms of basic service delivery. That sounds like a very kind of boring process, but it's absolutely not. It's how we make political change. It's how we design uh, and structure and, and redesign our systems to actually meet people's basic uh, needs. And it's the essential political skill uh, that's required to actually make an idea like equity a reality. It's not, when we talk about equity, we talk about social justice, we talk about all sorts of very fine sounding uh, moral concepts. But to move and to actually achieve those, it requires political skills. And I think um, from my reading, Sandy is one of the most skilled um, uh, doctors uh, in the country uh, who has really, really achieved some really great things uh, for uh, indigenous people, uh, for homeless people, uh, for um, uh, around uh, palliative care, uh, and bringing these, these apparently uh, distant issues and, 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 and people into our basic uh, healthcare system. So I'm, I'm delighted uh, that he is now uh, well, the president-elect, essentially, of, of, of uh, the Canadian Medical Association. And I'm delighted, too, that the Canadian Medical Association, with, uh, with Courtney's on the board and a few other people as well, um, is really moving to be um, a, 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 um, what I would consider to be a, a deeply responsible uh, institution in terms of uh, achieving better health for, for Canadians. Uh, so uh, with that introduction, I'll just in, uh, ask Sandy to come to the podium and to give us the Canadian Medical Association's perspective uh, on this issue. So thank you. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks everyone, it's really uh, an honor and a privilege to be here. Thanks for the kind introduction, James. Um, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it takes uh, political will to make the change, and I guess that's uh, it's always my effort. I am, I'm really delighted, actually, to be in the, in the um, position I am in, and with this issue of climate change, it's really time to uh, kind of put all the background into action, and I hope uh, the CMA will be able to, to do that. So, um, I'm here to demonstrate the CMA's uh, support for this year's brief and to share our concerns with the immediate and growing effects of climate change. Bottom line, climate change has risen to the top of our agenda as the most important critical public health imperative of our times. James, the CMA is on the bus. I just hope that this is uh, a fossil free <laughs> electric vehicle. <laughs> um, I mean, I see it as our responsibility, along with the Lance account and partners, to reframe climate change as the health issue, one that I think Courtney uh, referred to earlier, and the most important one affecting more people around the world than any other. Sadly, um, if I may say so, it's probably more impactful than violence around the world and even more than poverty. Um, we're really proud to be involved in this year's Lancet report and to show our support for its findings. We joined the Canadian Public Health Association in calling for the implementation of these Canada-specific recommendations that Courtney just outlined. Um, we believe that seven, seven policy recommendations are at a minimum the key areas that policymakers should focus on in the foreseeable future. We've got to get the message out that climate change isn't something that happens elsewhere. I think most Canadians kind of feel that way, um, that we're going to be protected here somehow. Um, and um, as has been mentioned, the past six months alone, we've seen, um, we've seen many of those uh, changes here in Canada. The wildfires in BC, um, I experienced it myself out in the Okanagan uh, last summer. Um, I think we have to do that in order to really, again, be able to feel it, just like you did, Courtney, in, in Yellowknife. Uh, the heat waves in Ontario and Quebec the storm surges in the Maritimes, the list does go on. It's clear that these aren't just isolated pockets of unusual weather. From coast to coast to coast, all of us are feeling the effects in one way or another. I'm already seeing the impacts on my own patient's health. In my day-to-day -day work, I'm a palliative care physician, 
And much of my work entails really going out into people's homes, and as well I, I work on the streets, um, in the shelters, in rooming houses of Toronto, um, and this is where I'm seeing uh, a huge impact. Um, in this past summer's heat wave, I care for some very ill, often elderly patients with end-stage respiratory disease, lung cancer, um, living in very minimally furnished apartments or shelters with no windows, no air conditioning, no fans, and they were just struggling for breath. And I'm seeing it over and over. Um, as Courtney, I think, mentioned very uh, aptly, um, the social terms of health are key in this uh, discussion. These vulnerable, there are so many vulnerable groups of Canadians who are being hit harder than any um, with the effects of climate change. Seniors, children, infants, and those with pre-existing medical conditions are at particular high risk. But for all of us, uh, climate change is no longer something to worry about in the distant future or something that's happening halfway around the globe. It's happening now, it's happening at home, and we know it. A Health Canada poll recently stated that four to five Canadians are convinced climate change is happening, and one or two believe it's a current health risk. But my sense is, again, I don't see most Canadians as seeing it as a critical health issue until it affects them personally. Although many physicians understand the effects that climate change can have on health, the heat-related deaths, for example, the worsening of respiratory conditions, the increase in prevalence of vector-borne infectious diseases, the food insecurity, just to name a few, but only nim limited numbers of physicians live and practice in a way that reduces their carbon footprint. Aside from CAPE, uh, really too few physicians organizations have made climate change much of a priority. So I want to say let's change that. We need to get the message out about climate change as the public health issue of our times. And as has also been, uh, been mentioned, it's not only about physical or biological health consequences of climate change. I think that's how most people think of it. Um, while those physical effects are many, we're really starting to understand the strong mental health implications as well. Uh, not too many physicians have considered the psychological and mental impacts of climate change. The PTSD from wildfires and anxiety around food insecurity are just a couple of examples. Um, again, Courtney sort of showed what's happening in the Canadian North where the changing ice patterns and fluctuating temperatures are affecting cultural hunting practices and the traditional way of life for many people. People are turning into migrants around the world because of climate change. So we cannot underestimate the psychological and emotional impact of changes like these. And it will be important that we take all aspects of health into consideration as we move forward. So where do we go from here? Where do, where do we go as the CMA, as the leaning organization? So at the CMA, this concern about climate change really has been a concern of ours for many years. We came up with an initial policy in 2007, and uh, we're currently working with many other groups to see how we can make a difference at home and at the international level. At the CMA, we recognize there's a greater need for public and health professional awareness and education about climate change in order to change the understanding of the health consequences and support for strategies to reduce greenhouse gases and mitigate the effects of climate change. Therefore, in support of the recommendations, we will advocate for, one, a national public awareness program on the importance of the environment and global change to personal health. Two, encourage health science faculties and the medical schools to enhance their provision of educational programs on environmental health and to foster the development of continuing education models, uh, modules on environmental health and environmental health practices. Three, we recommend ongoing surveillance and support for research on health impacts of climate change as well as the effectiveness of various mitigation and adoption strategies. Number four, we need to identify the most vulnerable populations, the particular health impacts of climate change on these populations and possible new protections for these populations. We need to increase the collection accuracy of health data, particularly for, again, the vulnerable and underserved populations. Not yet there. Six, federal and provincial territorial governments need to work together to improve the ability of the public to adapt to climate change and catastrophic weather events. We're seeing some uh, counter movement to that currently. <laughs> Number seven, the federal government needs to develop some concrete actions to reduce the health impact of climate related emissions. Number eight, we have to be able to prepare for climate emergencies. Do we have the adequate search capacity within our healthcare system 
to be prepared for an increase in illness related to climate change effects? I have a sense we, we don't. Number nine, we have to advocate not only for strengthening the healthcare system, but for infrastructure like housing for vulnerable populations, especially our indigenous populations throughout the country. Number 10, it's a question really, what is our responsibility to rebuild public health capacity globally? The CMA is advocating the Government of Canada become a global leader in promoting equitable carbon neutral economic, industrial, and social policies and practices that fight global warming and adopt specific greenhouse gas reduction targets as determined by the evolving science of climate change. We support that healthcare professionals act within their professional settings to reduce environmental impact of medical activities and to develop environmentally sustainable professional settings. In terms of action at the government level, our latest policy formally outlines our support for climate change initiatives by the Government of Canada, such as the Kyoto Protocol. We also recommend that federal, provincial, and territorial governments work together to bring more attention to this area and strengthen our public health system to protect all Canadians from the risk. Perhaps the strongest message we can get out is that carbon pricing is the single most important instrument to drive a health response to climate change we have to put a price on pollution. <laughs> so as has been said already, really much more work is still to be done. That is why the CMA is exploring how we'll work with our other stakeholders to address health concerns related to climate change on a global scale. Our board is currently exploring our, our role and further in making a positive impact on climate change. The decision related to CMA's role in mitigating climate change to help improve the health outcomes is expected early in 2019. We're still working on it. And because we have uh, Courtney on the board, I have to say we're really uh, moving ahead. Thanks, Courtney. We're also looking at supporting the work of other groups, such as the Canadian Federation of Medical Students, who are looking to get climate change built into the medical school curriculum and help better prepare future generations of physicians. Um, this is where I have hope, but it's still <laughs> unbelievable to me that in 2018, medical students are not yet learning about the health impacts of climate change. It just blows my mind. As climate change becomes a bigger and bigger issue, physicians have an important role to play in helping the public understand the health impacts. Providing those one-on-one -on -one discussions between doctor and patient as to the personal health effects of climate change, because uh, it matters to people personally, as well as promoting understanding about population health and advocating for possible solutions. Physicians and the CMA have high credibility in the public side. We need to leverage that credibility in getting that message out. The CMA's pos uh, position strongly endorsed that what's good for the environment is good for human health. It's time for all of us to fully engage in the debate and ensure that protecting human health is the bottom line. So really thank you for the opportunity to address you today. Know that your CMA is your, the CMA is your partner in this advocacy. Yes. That was great. Uh, who would imagine that CMA would say uh, such uh, uh, clear, direct, and impactful uh, things? Um, I just uh, really look forward to saying that. <laughs> Surprise. <Never>? Surprise. <laughs> That's great. Keep going. There's uh, kids in every doctor's visit. <laughs> I'd like to uh, invite Ian uh, uh, Coulter uh, to the podium and uh, to the beginning. And, and um, I would like to just uh, just give you a sense of what, what he does. He's the executive director of the Canadian Public Health Association. And the Canadian Public Health Association uh, is a national uh, uh, association. It's independent. It's not for profit. And its primary focus is uh, to uh, design, develop, and implement um, public health policies um, uh, and programs uh, across the country. Um, Ian is the um, executive director since 2013. Uh, he has a wealth of experience. He's been with the organization for, for, for a number of years. Uh, he has a wealth of experience um, deriving uh, very practically around HIV um, and uh, developing public health strategies for HIV uh, affected individuals and communities across the country. Um, and as well as sexually transmitted infections, uh, hepatitis C. Uh, these are really, for non-medical, non-public health people in the room, these are extremely important, high-priority 
public health issues and have been the dominant issues, in fact, of the last uh, 15 or so years. And Ian has played a critical role in developing programs around, uh, around each of these issues. Uh, he's also um, an expert in uh, communications, played a, a key role in, as a communications uh, person and strategist, I guess, within the Canadian Public Health Association. And also in working with uh, um, the private sector around public health issues. Um, and um, uh, he's been, uh, as I said, uh, executive director since 2013. Uh, and it's a real uh, a pleasure to ask him to come to the podium and to give the Canadian Public Health uh, Association's perspective uh, on the report. Thank you. Thanks very much, James, and uh, thanks to the uh, WA um, Institute uh, for hosting today's session. Um, huge thanks to Courtney Howard uh, for being the first author two years in a row on this report. Uh, without her dedication and uh, sheer persistence, it wouldn't have happened. Uh, and especially for the Canadian Medical, Medical Association who joined CPAJ this year. Um, I'm in the unenviable position of a lot more intelligent people have spoken and taken most of my notes already, uh, and we're about to go into break. So I'm going to focus on um, some practical stuff. Uh, certainly, uh, CPHA's, uh, I'll start with public health isn't the publicly funded healthcare system. It is the portion of the health system that focuses on primordial and primary prevention of disease, illness, and injury. And by primordial, we mean uh, the causes of the causes. And in that, we take an eco-social perspective on that. Human rights are incredibly important. Social justice is the driving force behind the work of the association. Uh, health equity. Uh, so it's not that we're just doing the right thing. Uh, it's at the right time for the right people and, and putting resources in the right place. Having said that, um, like the public health system as part of the overall health system, which receives less than 5% of funding, we're a fairly small organization. Uh, uh, our membership is completely voluntary. Uh, but through the dedication of volunteers like Courtney, uh, we can achieve great things. We were formed in 1910 by a group of doctors in Toronto who were concerned about the water, uh, uh, drinking water quality and sanitation, uh, the lack of um, adherence to sanitation regulations uh, in the slums of Front Street. Uh, so we started uh, in the ecology area and continued. Uh, since the 1930s, we have continually spoken out on issues such as uh, air pollution and other contaminants. Um, in 1991, we published a landmark report on human ecosystem health and made certain predictions about the expected health impacts of climate change. So we ra raised the red flag um, and we're really glad that others are, are, are hearing that clarion call. In 2015, as Courtney mentioned, uh, Dr. Trevor Hancock, uh, formerly of the University, University of Victoria, um, led the development of a massive uh, paper on the ecological determinants of health. And I identified the range of ecological threats to human health that actually James highlighted very well in his introduction. Uh, and it's really Trevor who's um, been spearheaded this, this eco-social approach to how we do things. You can't disentangle the ecological determinants of health from the social determinants of health. Uh, and to do so does each other uh, a disservice. So we're not just talking uh, the talk, we're actually taking action. Uh, later this morning, uh, this afternoon, I will be uh, 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 swearing an affidavit to uh, apply for intervener status uh, in the appeal court of Saskatchewan uh, in support of the federal government's greenhouse gas pollution crisis. All right. So in the Ontario Appeal Court, and uh, once New Brunswick figures out what it's doing, we'll probably be doing it there, and I think as we all have guessed, this will end up in the Supreme Court, one way or the other. It is really crucial that when we talk about carbon pricing, we actually use really accurate language to express what it is we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to put a price on pollution. So I'll challenge each and every one of you, every time someone says carbon tax, correct them. We're changing behaviors here. We did it with tobacco, we've done it in, in, with uh, toxic substances. We're using, uh, a part of our argument is that the federal government has the right to use criminal law to change behavior. 
We've done it before, and we need to do it now more so than ever. So every time someone says carbon tax and a tax grab, you correct them. It's not. It's putting a price on pollution. We're all responsible. We're all using fossil fuels every single day. Okay? It's all part of our behaviors. Nobody's innocent. And it's not about pointing a finger. It's about saying, how do we want to change? And what's the best way to motivate people? Put a price on something. If it's not that important to you, you'll change your behavior. And so that's really crucial going forward. So obviously, we support all of the recommendations in this uh, report. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't have put our logo on it. Um, <laughs> and as mentioned, it's irrefutable scientific evidence. Uh, has established that the anthropogenic uh, climate change is a critical public health issue at subnational, national, and global levels. So this isn't something that we're going to um, uh, be able to talk our way out of. So while carbon pricing <coughs> is our current focus, CPHA is also pleased to support a group of dedicated volunteers like the medical students uh, uh, who are led by, uh, the, uh, this group is led by Blake Poland and Margaret Parks, the <coughs> ecological, determinants of, uh, ecological Determinants Group on Education, who are working similarly to, to ensure that uh, uh, the curriculum for uh, people working in public health also includes education on the ecological determinants of health. Um, the association is also developing a policy agenda to develop a series of position statements on various aspects of the ecological determinants of health over the coming years. There's, so there is lots to do, uh, and we're very pleased to be part of this ongoing conversation, but more importantly, uh, taking a very concrete step in uh, supporting the federal government's right to put a price on pollution. We may disagree at the price they put on it or what else needs to be done, uh, but in this court case, uh, we're arguing for their right to do it because I think we're going to be not surprised, but horribly disappointed by what, by what the Ontario government has to say later today. Uh, and if, they, if the rumors are accurate and they follow the Australian model, we're looking at our rates to go up, not down. So uh, it's a crucial piece of work. And once again, uh, uh, I know I'm a broken record, but everybody in this room can do something by challenging the partisan uh, storyline that this is a tax grab and it's a carbon tax. It's not. It's putting a price on pollution. So please don't forget that. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you so much. That was fantastic. Uh, so I'm going to um, actually, um, we're, we're going to just move right into the panel discussion. Uh, anybody who needs to break, they're welcome to take whatever time they need to visit the washroom or have a coffee. There's coffee in the back, um, but just go as you as you please. But we're going to move right into the Q and A, uh, which uh, and discussion, uh, which will go from now uh, right through to uh, 11:30, uh, so the next 35 minutes or so. Uh, and I'm also going to take this as an opportunity uh, to introduce a couple of other people who will be on the who are um, uh, here today and who uh, are going to be on the panel. Uh, and um, uh, and so I just have people, who, Courtney and Ian and um, others, to come up uh, now. Uh, and as I'm, uh, please do that as I'm as I'm speaking. Come on up. Um, so Katie, uh, Katie Hayes, uh, is a PhD candidate at the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto, uh, and her research uh, is really her research um, is focused on. Uh, climate change, social equity, and mental health, um, and public health policy. And she's really focused on looking at so, uh, the psychosocial impacts associated with climate change. Uh, so Katie, I just want you to come up as well. Uh, and um, as well, um, George uh, Kitching uh, is a medical student uh, at the Schulich School of Medicine at uh, Western University. Uh, and uh, George um, has a uh, uh, some prior, much uh, um, highly relevant prior experience um, uh, um, in uh, uh, climate change and health uh, through his master's degree, uh, which he finished um, at the, um, in Norway. Uh, and that, that was really focusing on global health from a climate change uh, uh, perspective. He's in his second year of studies at, uh, um, at, at Schulich, 
uh, at uh, Western, and he's very much engaged in creating a network uh, of uh, students, uh, public health uh, students, um, that are um, uh, committed to addressing uh, health and climate change. So why don't you come on up, George? Uh, and then um, the other, uh, uh, the, the last person we're going to invite is uh, uh, Ed, uh, Ed Z. Uh, and uh, Ed is a family uh, and emergency uh, medicine doctor um, and lecturer at the University of Toronto. Uh, and he has a master's degree and prior experience and ongoing experience in health policy and planning and financing. Um, that master's from London School, High, uh, London School of Economics. Uh, and he's uh, deeply engaged with health, health providers against policy, uh, against poverty, sorry. <laughs> it would actually be, you know, an interesting group to be part of. Um, yeah, um, there's a few of them actually around. Uh, um, so, but he's very much engaged with the health providers against poverty uh, and uh, doctors for safe cycling uh, and um, uh, working to develop also uh, with others um, political guidelines for homeless people um, and also working with the Canadian Association uh, for Physicians with the Environment. Uh, and uh, so, Ed, why don't, you, uh, why don't you come on up? So what I would encourage people to do uh, is uh, uh, come to the microphone because this is being streamed. So we actually need to capture your, your voice electronically. Uh, so please come to the microphone with, uh, with, your, with your question. Um, and um, uh, I just encourage people to go up now. And as we're waiting, I'm going to ask um, each of the three new people that I've just introduced just to say a few brief words uh, about uh, their particular perspective. Uh, so what I would ask you to do is just pass the microphone uh, over. Um, uh, let's start here with you, Ed, and then we'll go to uh, we'll go to we'll go to you. Um, Great, thank go you ahead. for the uh, the wonderful presentation this morning. So I'm Edward Shia. I'm um, uh, a lecturer at University of Toronto, and uh, my perspective is that um, I had recently done a, a master's of health policy, and in that I examined perceptions of uh, <coughs> climate change and the health impacts of climate change. And I'm going to be looking at it from a uh, also a communications and behavior change angle, like uh, like Ian mentioned. Hi, uh, my name is George Kitching. I'm a medical student at Trulick uh, Western University. Um, and I've been in, uh, briefly involved with the CFMS um, with their campaign uh, to incorporate uh, climate change and health into medical curriculum around uh, across Canada. And I'm very, very happy to hear the CMA is, is so supportive of that. Um, the, the CFMS has developed a task force um, for the past several years. Uh, this past year, it was led by Manola Hackett at, at, uh, over in Alberta and, and, and a few others. And, and one of the things that they've developed is a set of core competencies to in, incorporate into medical schools. Um, and that, those core competencies um, have uh, been are undergoing a peer review process right now. And, and some of the panelists here actually have contributed to that peer review. Um, but one of the things I want to say is that uh, this, I, I've recently joined the heart to the, the, this particular task force, um, Health and Environmental Adaptive uh, Response Task Force. Um, and this year we are committed to trying to get this uh, input, these core competencies input into the curriculum. Um, yeah. Katie? Hi everyone, <coughs> uh, can you hear me okay? My name is Katie Hayes and as James mentioned, And I'm also the lead author on the upcoming Climate Change and Health Assessment held led by Health Canada, looking at um, the chapter that I focus on for the first time that is going to be in there is the mental health impacts of climate change. Um, so I'm really interested in seeing the recommendation today to support funding on the mental health implications of climate change and psychosocial adaptation opportunities. Because it's a really important area, it's a growing, emerging area of study where we're looking at the risks and impacts, but we also need to really have a good understanding of what's being done to support people in their mental health and well-being. Not just formal care, but also informal care, communities coming together, and also to have an understanding of those who are on the front line. So really, uh, again, looking at our Indigenous population and our marginalized populations and the impacts to their mental health, because they are the first affected. So I'm glad to be here. Thanks. Thank you. No, I just know, Ian, are you going to moderate here? Or? 
certainly can. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. I'm good. I'm good. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to ask each panelist and each person, just give like a one or two minute reaction to what you've heard today. Um, and maybe we just start uh, with CMA. To be honest, my initial gut reaction is one of hope. Um, when, I, when I read the reports and when I saw the Canadian uh, specific recommendations, I have a sense of, even, even though the mountain is huge to climb, I do have a sense that we're uh, on the right side of history, that, we're, um, that we have no choice in this, and, um, and that so many people are doing so much incredible work, and the science, like you said, is, is not debatable anymore, that it just really gets me going to begin to advocate more and more. Reframing this as a health issue, I think, is the way to get the message out to Canadians. And um, understanding, again, uh, for me, how it impacts uh, all of us, and in particular our vulnerable populations, has sort of raised this for me uh, on the agenda as really the most important public health issue. We have many, but unless we deal with this one, uh, <laughs> dealing with the others is, is not going to be of much use. So uh, that's where I am. Thanks. Excellent. Courtney? I, I feel very hopeful too. So, um, you know, I got very worried about this about 10 years ago. I flew up uh, to one of my very first locums in the Arctic, picked up a book on the oil sands on my way there, and just fully, you know, went from zero to 150 in terms of my concern because I happened to be reading it in one of the most impacted places in the world. And at that point, there were not a lot of people in Canada talking about this. James Arbinsky was actually one of the very first other people that I met who was so concerned. And I remember I'd done a lot of reading at that point, and there wasn't a lot in the medical literature that was taking, that was telling us anything about what would happen if we went above two degrees Celsius. And meanwhile, I was reading, you know, the IPCC reports that were saying we were going way up. And I was like, there's a giant gap, and where are my medical elders? And I really felt, uh, frankly, kind of abandoned as a, I was a really recent grad, I had just graduated. Um, and it was pretty <coughs> lonely to be reading about this in, in the Arctic by myself. And so luckily I found tape and I have connected with many other people. So, you know, I have to say yesterday uh, with the CMA, um, you know, having the CMA's resources um, to get the kind of media that we, that is starting to feel like it is an effort that is adequate to the scope of the problem was an incredibly powerful day for me yesterday. You know, um, because we work, uh, this sector is so incredibly under-resourced, you have no idea. Like, what has occurred with the Lancet countdown, like in this stage of the funding cycle? You know, the, ne the next grant is bigger. But what has occurred, this has occurred because of effort on the scale of, you know how you see interns working on, on TV shows, and you're like, how does that guy not sleep? That is what produced this report. So, so right now the world community is being held together by an incredible, like a relatively small number of incredibly hardworking, incredibly talented people. And we need support now, so we, we need you. And so it's incredibly uh, just heartwarming and wonderful to now have you know, big institutions um, with, with clout and people who ha are so knowledgeable in so many ways coming to join forces. And I just really, really am very thankful. Great. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I've been trying to figure out how to say this, and, and it doesn't sound petty, but I can't figure it out, so I'm just going to say it. So grateful that um, what we talked about 30 years ago in the Human Ecosystem uh, Report is so I'm like, oh, okay, it's, it's, it's the same idea of the social determinants of health. We've talked about it in Canada for uh, 20 years. Uh, in the states, that they they just discovered the social determinants of health. Great, great. There's room for everybody. Uh, um, but and this is being. And, and I'm sorry, it sounded petty, and I didn't. I don't want it to be. I'm really happy that others are 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 on board. Um, the this is becoming a highly politicized, highly partisan discussion. It is not. So once again, not only is it pollution pricing, this isn't political, it's not partisan. Uh, big C conservatives and big and new democratics, and everybody's going to have the same health impacts. Framing this as a health issue gets it past it being political. 
Um, and there's a lot of forces that are working against us. I really don't know why, but they are. So if you are philanthropic, donate to an organization that is doing this kind of work. Yes, that's a little bit of self-serving pitch for myself, but <laughs> it's true. Uh, and don't start, start new organizations. There's lots of good organizations that can do this work. Uh, we don't need to fragment the effort. We need to focus the effort. Uh, just to briefly say that um, what I'm really pleased about is the real want and then action around tackling complacency. And that, I think there's no greater threat to our being able to tackle this challenge than being able to drive at complacency. And, and seeing the CMA and CPCH do this sort of work and the report, Courtney, that you've written, I think that's a, that's a crucial uh, movement forward. So I really say thank you. That's great. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask um, people, uh, uh, all of the people, I guess, well, are you all going to ask questions, or are you just kind of, okay, one, okay, good. Go ahead, sir. And then we'll go come to you. <coughs> we'll take two or three, and then we'll ask the panel to respond to the two or three. So go ahead, sir. It's on. Hello? Okay. Um, I'm hopeful. Uh, so many people with so many fantastic degrees uh, taking action, but I agree with your point. The first the, 1988 uh, uh, convention here that was here, a conference on climate change in Toronto, that was the time to act. Um, we need to have an emergency footing, and so I suggest that after, uh, Sandy, sorry, I don't know all your names, uh, sat down maybe 30 seconds and every single uh, doctor's visit would be on climate action, like this is affecting your public health. What would you do if every single patient came into your office that was needlessly drinking contaminated water every day. Y you would probably say something in every single visit. I think that's a reasonable analogy. We, we need to start changing yesterday, but the next best time is today. And so I'd say every single interaction, professional or casual, needs to have this message. Thank you. That's great. Uh, so I, I guess the question is, it, do you think I'm overstating it? And if so, why? <laughs> <laughs> and we'll just take a question here, and then we'll ask panel to respond. Go ahead. Hi there. First off, thank you very much uh, for all your uh, thoughts and uh, sharing the presentation. So my name is Dana Deeson. I'm the manager of the Impact Center on Climate Adaptation. Hi, Katie. Um, so my question really is, uh, what in your experience has been the role of the life and health insurance companies on this file? Mm -hmm. So we've worked with um, some of the life and health insurers before. Um, and in my experience, I feel like they can play a much bigger role, but what has been your experience with the life and health insurers in Canada? Because it seems like they would have uh, a vested interest in this as well. That's great. Here, go ahead, anybody who wants to respond to those two questions or one of those two questions, go ahead. I can jump in quickly. Yes, they have a huge vested interest because the more um, situations they avoid, the more money they make, which yeah. is kind of insidious, <laughs> but that's the nature of insurance. Uh, I do find that um, they are small C conservative organizations that shift very slowly uh, and don't put, don't invest enough in thinking about these uh, broader long-term issues. Uh, they're all hyper-focused on pharmacare right now, uh, understandably, uh, but their, their best investment would be in some policy, like long-term policy thinking. I just wanted to talk about, uh, you know, how to speak with patients. And so I just presented at the Family Medicine Forum, and so we've discussed this with family docs recently. And so one thing um, is that we can talk about things like things that improve health, um, you know, immediately. So we can encourage people to take their bike uh, everywhere they go. We know cycling reduces mortality, uh, which is incredible because there's almost nothing that reduces mortality if you apply it to a broad population. Uh, I have a friend who at Decision Point, so if her uh, person with diabetes is having trouble with their blood sugar, she'll encourage them to uh, undertake a, a plant-based diet. And she actually runs group visits four times a year with a nutritionist um, to teach people how to eat in a plant-based way. And so that's actually something else that we really need to focus on right now as a health community. One of our uh, recommendations from last year is brief was for strong health sector support for the Canada Food Guide, the draft food guide. And we actually just met with someone from the Prime Minister's office yesterday who, you know, let us know that they could use some strong health sector support for the food guide right now. So we need to back them up on the science. 
Um, it is sort of a plant-rich diet that they're recommending, and if we manage to get that through in its final form, we will actually be leading from a policy perspective because there's a giant Lancet Heat Commission coming out in January that's going to recommend a really plant-based diet. But they need, like, in the next one to two months, a really, really strong push. So if you can write an op-ed about that, if you can speak out about how the science has been sent, if you can, you know, talk to your MP about that, that is a huge service. Because if we lose this right now, we're going to, you know, we're going to be back five to ten years. Um, and just in terms of eco-anxiety, I was talking to the person who does a lot of anxiety uh, uh, counseling, Greg DeBoer, and he said that he wouldn't medicate um, eco-anxiety, he would prescribe climate action. So he would say, well actually, this is a constructive unpleasant emotion, which he calls a cue, and the cue is for a new behavior. And so you fix this by changing, you know, it's the same thing as when we used to see, you know, if a lion appeared, you'd be like, constructive unpleasant emotion, and then you would take action. Um, it's a cue for a new behavior, and so we said, you know, we could prescribe 30 minutes of climate action a day. <laughs> I just wanted to comment on that quickly. At NYU and their environmental health department, um, students can go in with their eco anxieties and they are prescribed um, activism. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so that's something a program that's already being done. <clears throat> and just back to your question, um, you know, as physicians, we're mostly dealing with downstream problems, right? You know, all the effects kind of come in and ultimately comes in the presentation of symptoms or whatever the clinical problem is. I think. Um, that's what turns a lot of us on to advocacy, sort of at what I call the micro, meso, and macro levels. That micro is advocating for that patient and getting changes done. Meso, sort of at the regional community level, what does your community need? Is it fresh water? What's, what's happening that happens? And then there's this macro level advocacy. And a lot of us can be uh, stimulated to turn on to do something about the problems that we see every day in the office. And bringing it up and linking the symptoms to what the the patient is experiencing, I think is a really key of public awareness. So making that just that quick one statement uh, can go a long way uh, towards getting other people, patients who need to be our partners in this. We need to collaborate and co-design the systems and the changes that we're gonna make. And if we have patients as allies, we're gonna get a lot more done. So I'm strongly supportive of your advocacy, even at that micro level in the office. Um, I'm just going to expand on both of uh, the answers to your question. So it's actually not just the life insurance and health insurance companies that should be worried about this. It's also property insurance. It's also every business and government. And we're seeing globally that people are taking attention to this. Um, companies are doing risk assessments, especially insurance companies, to see what's going to happen in the next few years if nothing changes. And to answer your question as well, I think we got to look beyond the uh, the doctor's office. Doctors are excellent advocates, as, as Sandy knows, but um, we have to find ways to talk to people who are not in this room, who are not already uh, supporters, and we need to find the right language for that. I'll just uh, give a quick uh, word. Um, in August, I had the honor to attend the IFMSA August meeting as part of the Canadian delegation. So what is that? Because most um, people don't know. Sorry, the IFMSA is the International Federation of Medical Student Associations. Um, and I was part of the CFMS delegation, the Canadian Federation of Medical Students. Um, and as part of that delegation, I actually conducted interviews uh, with some of the other, the other delegates um, into their experiences of, of uh, climate change incorporation into their medical curriculum. And we did a handful of interviews and, and presented them a couple weeks ago um, at a conference. And, and one of the things that came up was that no one was having any real formal education on this. A lot of it was informal. Um, but what, what struck me from, the, from uh, reviewing the, in, the interviews was that everyone had stories. Everyone um, could identify the health impacts in their country and, and uh, through their experiences and, and reading the news and things like that. So, so like, we, were, we interviewed people from, from Algiers and Trinidad and Tobago and, and South Korea and everyone had stories. Um, and I think that's the language that we need to be talking about both to patients and, and also to collect the patient's stories as well and, and present them to a wider forum. Mm -hmm. um, um, I'm Nail Kuparty, I'm with the Environmental Commissioner's Office and I manage the climate change trial here in Ontario. Um, it's a bit of an advertisement. Uh, we know that the government is going to be releasing its climate change report, so that's a correction. It's going to be releasing its environment report and within that, there may be some comments about climate change. Um, I would really encourage everyone to read that report. We saw an embargoed copy of it last night. 
I would like you to focus on the tools that they are proposing. I would like you to focus on the targets that they are proposing. And I'd really like to encourage everyone to speak out about what is being proposed in this province. Um, thank you for raising the issue of the EK Act. That's something that our office wrote about in our climate change report that we released at the end of September, which really calls for exactly, of course, as I mentioned, long-term planning. And we're seeing a complete shift uh, going away from that in this province. So I guess it's not really, is it a question? Is it a concern? Um, you know, I heard, Courtney, you're talking to go and meet with a lot of the ministers at Federally yesterday. Um, I am thrilled to be here and hearing what the CMA is talking about in terms of really emphasizing the carbon pricing, the role of carbon pricing, and challenging, like you said, challenging it as portrayal as a tax. Um, so we, I'm going to put some copies of our summary of our latest report there, but I guess my question, if I really have one, is, um, what are the plans now to engage with this government the, at the provincial level? And uh, where does this go? We've had the conversations at the federal level. I just wanted to hear what, what the discussion was at the provincial level. That's really my question. Okay, do you want to, yeah. anybody here? Yeah, so go ahead. Hi, I'm Eunice yeah. Troy. I'm a Lutheran graduate of the Masters of Public Health Program at Western University. Um, I hope you'll have some empathy on me because, as you said, to speak in front of you right now, I feel really nervous. I can hear my heartbeat. I can hear, <laughs> can hear what I'm saying. Um, but I flew from Vancouver yesterday to attend this event because it's very dear to my heart. And um, yes, so I had no idea what to expect when I was coming, but I leave here today already with so many questions. So I hope I'll be able to interact with each of you later at break and at the end of the session. But my question to the group is that, uh, Dr. Brockman, you mentioned that the poll reports, and I re read something recently in a journal, a uh, qualitative study, that said something similar that both the Canadian public and Canadian health care providers both uh, recognize the need to take climate change action. But when asked, do they actually, the response was a majority no. So given that, um, and the recommendations that came out from the Lancet report before and this time, the adaptive actions seem to depend on public engagement, and the mitigative actions seem to largely depend on political and stakeholder engagement. Mm -hmm. So in light of that, how do we maintain that and encourage that to conduct the activities that we need to, especially in the situations with vulnerable populations that don't really have the resources to take that sort of action? Mm -hmm. Great, great questions. Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have two questions going. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a little harder, so I'll, I'll address the uh, the uh, final one. Um, you know, we're very we're still early, even though this has really been going on since 1988. The the messaging isn't out there yet, and so I think we have to, in order to get the adaptive strategies, the mitigation strategies. We have a, a very a strong educational challenge out there amongst health professionals, for sure. Um, how are we going to uh, get these word out? By taking this on as a priority, okay, by working with our, our health science faculties, our, our medical faculties, with our national colleges and medical education, as well as with the other health professionals, I think we need to make a concerted effort to begin there. And getting people who are involved to walk the talk, okay, in order to demonstrate um, those of us that are involved our commitment to this issue. Uh, then we begin to, it, it gets catchy, okay, we begin to catch on, but we need to continue to have these messages. And I agreed earlier uh, um, with the statements about, um, about making it simple and making it personal. And this is affecting every single one of us. So the real challenge, I think, is in. The, uh, in the education and raising awareness. Does anybody else want to respond to that issue? Um, yes, I think that there, so as you mentioned, there's there's educational gaps. And so when I, when I sort of cross communities and I go from the academic community to the policy community to the advocacy community within health and then think about how that needs to interact with the advocacy communities outside of health, I really feel like it's this part of the spectrum that right now needs the most work. 
um, or at least is the least attended to. So we, the CanMed's role is, as you know, one of the six um, petals on the flower for, for Canadian medical schools is advocacy. And it's generally well recognized that's probably the least well taught skill set. And unfortunately, that's really what it requires to get done. So, you know, I run a lot of advocacy skills workshops and, you know, I sent an email out the day before the launch to all of the authors of the policy briefs like, oh gee, we didn't talk to you about talking about media. This is how you do a Skype interview. This is how you do a radio interview. This is how you do a TV interview, right? We should all have media training straight up. So Danielle Martin, I was on the Canadian Doctors for Medicare board. You're on her board, you get media training because you never know when you're gonna have to talk to somebody and it's about the simple messaging that you're talking about. So we have various skill sets that we need to make and we need to make connections. This is super transdisciplinary as you were talking about and that's relationship building. So that means taking your body and putting it in somebody else's room. And, and that's super fun, but it's different. Like if you find yourself the only health professional in a room of energy economists, that's probably a good move. Um, and so, you know, Bora from the Pemina Institute is here, so he's done that. So he is an energy person that, you know, Kate has relied on a lot. Um, and he has come here so he can learn. We need to go to his room next. Um, and Steve Cornish is here from the David Suzuki Foundation, and we need to go to his room next. And so that is, you know, we need to go to the urban planner's room so we can make those connections because that's where we're sort of, uh, that's how we're going to actually get things done in the world. Great. So I just asked Gabe to comment, but I will also just ask that to, we've got a whole bunch of questions and we have actually a really little bit of time. So let's try to focus the questions and focus the answers to the best that we can. I'll try to make it really quick. So three points. One is, um, you know, at national, sub-national levels, it can be hard to make policy changes uh, if you can try to focus on municipal actions because those could be quick wins. Um, the second issue is when we're thinking about um, uh, governments that are at odds with the science, uh, for example, what's happening now with carbon pricing, um, I think it's important to ground that in the values of the government. So carbon pricing is a market-based uh, mechanism, uh, which should be consistent with conservative values, and it also re relies on individual action, and I think those are very consistent um, with what this government should be promoting. And the last thing is that, um, uh, it, you know, it's not just the, uh, the climate modeling that we're seeing in terms of the, the science and the IPCC reports, um, there's also this new type of modeling called uh, shared social economic pathways, which also looks at how well the political confluence supports the actions. And so if we are fragmented, um, if there's conflict in the world, if we don't have um, convergence on our actions, uh, it's going to be much more difficult to achieve the goals that we want. Okay, so I'm going to ask um, maybe two, question, two questions from here and then two questions from there, and then we'll put the, the bunch to the... Uh, to the panel and you can respond uh, in a focused way. So let's go through here. Go ahead. Good morning. Hi, my name is Jeremy Thiel. I'm a physician at North York General Hospital here in Toronto. Um, very encouraged and hopeful, as some of the panelists have said, around seeing people in this room taking concern, being passionate about this issue. But I'm also concerned that this room should be a whole lot bigger for the size of the issue and the number of people that need to be involved. So trying to be brief on the question here. We've identified that this problem has been around for 30, 40 years. We haven't taken enough action on it. We don't have enough public and political will to come to the, to the solution. So do we need to reframe the question differently? The panel here has said, yes, we need to frame it around, frame it around health. So the suggestion or the debate question for you is, is climate change the right term anymore? I would think not. Maybe it needs to be climate toxicity or something similar that would energize the public more to say, oh, this isn't some passive thing that's just changing, it's actually killing us. So, that's my question. Great, go ahead, sir. Actually, if I could follow up, because my ties, good, yep. is this on? Yes. Yeah, sure. Fantastic presentation, thanks very much. My name is uh, Gary Boda, I'm an emergency physician, and i um, been trying to get our institution to move forward to a strategic plan to incorporate it. So, one quick thing first, for the medical students and the CMA, any any thoughts of trying to get the institutions, the medical schools, to make it part of their mandate creating carbon? Because we know the faculty, people like me, have a lot more money invested, a lot larger pension plans right now um, that could be swayed and put into non-carbon fund. We know for every million dollars that we invest in Canada, that my pension includes, uh, so I create 50 tons of carbon. So that. To come back to this concept, Graham Stahl, head of Nature Canada, recently came, came out with a report 
um, looking at what do environmentalists think. And his concept was, we don't really have a good term in this country yet or in the world around environmentalism. We have phosphates, we have climate change, we have all these things. But what's the term that's going to turn this into a, an ethical as opposed to just a talking about numbers and stats kind of thing? So I throw it out to the um, uh, folks here. What's the one or two words that we could potentially be using to make this a moral issue? Okay. Um, go ahead. <coughs> right behind. And then we'll come here. And then we can take those two. Great panel. Um, ben Chan, for, uh, I teach global health at the U of T, I also work for Open River World Bank. But I'm also a reverse doc in rural, a uh, number of communities in rural Ontario. And I want to respond to the, uh, the questions about, you know, why aren't we all on board? Well, the typical profile of the people that I've served in these communities are, I'd like to point out two things. One, they're so focused on getting food on the table and, and going from paycheck to paycheck that they don't have time most of the time to look at these, think about these big picture global issues. Two, their options with regards to the use of gasoline are limited. In, in economic terms, the elasticity of demand for gasoline is a whole lot lower because they need to drive a whole lot of distance, need pickup trucks. They can't, uh, you know, they can't hop in the subway that we can in urban areas. And third, this message about premium as a health, we already have huge issues in premium issues on health. The, the rate of diet of obesity is massive and, 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 and on, a, on a scale that it just blows my mind every time I, I go to my emerge shifts. We're already having difficulty getting messages that you know, eat healthily as, as physicians. And, and I, I worry about how you know, putting forward a message about um, climate change being environmental health is going to resonate when we already have these other challenges. And these are the people that are voting for our politicians to say no to a carbon tax because it's a tax grab. How are you gonna get these people on board? Because they're an important part of our society, we need them on board. And last uh, final, go ahead, and then we'll come back. Don't worry. Hi, I'm Thomas Lusky, but I'm a family doc, public health doc at St. Mike's, work with the homeless um, and environmentalist. Um, Courtney, I'm glad you raised the issue of a plant-based diet. Um, I feel that it's uh, the, the the support uh, for a plant-based diet is probably indisputable. The American Dietetic Association put out a strong statement um, saying that it was appropriate diet for all age groups and every stage of life. Um, what would it take for, uh, well I don't know, maybe CAPE has already made a statement, but for the CMA, CAPE, uh, CFMS, CP CPHA to make statements uh, in, in support of uh, plant-based diet being like the, 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 the preferred diet of choice. Um, also, you know, considering that, um, I think the CMAJ recently came up with a study saying that the current uh, Canada Fruit Guide is unsustainable. It would take more than one planet to, for everybody to, to meet that diet. And uh, similarly, somewhere between 20 50% of greenhouse gases are due to uh, our non plant based diet. Thanks. So I just ask the panels to be brief in their replies. You don't have to reply to everything, but just to try to you know, capture the essence of one or two of the questions. And then we have four other people who want to ask a question. And we have to finish within the next few minutes, so please go ahead. Let's start on the same, George, maybe if you want. Okay. Um, all right, uh, uh, super quick. Um, uh, one thing I want to say about uh, medical students and um, engaging with uh, institutions, um, uh, we have a good example from Australia where medical students have, uh, have created a, what was called uh, Code Green, um, which was their attempt at, at uh, creating, um, developing climate change understanding and awareness among the medical students. And one of the things that they focused on is greening the healthcare, the hospitals, and, and the healthcare system. Um, and, and I find that when I talk with medical students in Canada at Western and, and other places, that actually has a lot of traction, um, but because people can buy into that pretty quickly. They see all the garbage that's thrown out at the car at, in the hospitals um, on, on rotations. Um, actually, that's, that's all I'm going to say for now. Um, so this is just to address uh, Dr. Chan's comment. Um, I heard this amazing uh, example recently at the Global Health Conference, and this was on the Ebola crisis in uh, DRC. Um, one of the interviewees said, uh, Ebola kills, but the rebels kill more. And I think that really speaks to your issue of, we do have a lot of competing priorities, and, and we, we need to figure out a way um, to make people uh, understand why climate change affects them now, even though the effects are not tangible. And that's very difficult. 
Uh, we have to make things personally re relevant. We can't use the same language for everyone. I'll just pick up on the point you made about uh, using the term and, and maybe a different mm -hmm. way of looking at it. I, I think that would be very helpful. I don't know whether um, climate change could be better represented to be able to turn into a way of saying this is an actionable uh, challenge, one that we can take every day in, in the small things that we do, because I think that's where bringing on board um, people to work on this on this issue would be very helpful. So whether that's climate toxicity or something uh, alike, um, that would be potentially a, a useful way of changing how language is used for us. A whole bunch of things about it go as fast as it can. In Ontario, we're going to be seeking intervener status as well. Um, uh, second, uh, about the food guide. Like, go of everything you hated about the old food guide and just focus on sending a positive message to government about what the new food guide can be, because the forces of industry are putting incredible pressure. So if you have a voice, use it. Three, we have to have a positive message, and that's why I'm not sure climate toxicity is the way to go. Maybe planetary health, if we can give that more legs, but every significant social movement that changed the course of um, history in the 20th century had hope. There was something we were going towards. And, and fear-based uh, uh, initiatives don't work. We, we learned that in HIV AIDS, okay? You gotta give people hope. From there, you can have change. Um, yeah, I'll quickly, quickly, uh, so to Gary Boda's point about finances, so something incredibly I have not mentioned at all, barely in the last few days, is that the CMA actually divested from fossil fuels. So that's giant, and actually they got an in-print shout out from that in the International Campground Report, which we should really be really proud of. Um, yeah. um, number two, I, I put my money behind planetary health at this particular point. Um, number three, so uh, to the plant-based diet, so Ian and I have co-authored op-eds on supporting the plant-based diet. Um, I'm wondering right now, just sitting in this room, whether there's room for a like pretty imminent co-authored op-ed between the CPHA and the CMA on that topic. I think it would be really helpful. So, you know, it's a discussion we can go away and have, because this needs to happen in the next, I'm talking the next month. Um, like, go home and figure out what you're going to do about the food guide today. Um, and the uh, number four, in terms of greening healthcare, so there's a real opportunity. David Pension, who has been in charge of the Sustainable Development Unit at the uh, NHS, which has been measuring its carbon footprint every year for the last 10 years, incredibly, and they have greenhouse gas targets associated with their work too, and they've demonstrated, I think, about a 15% decrease in the face of a 30% increase in clinical activity or something very along those lines, is recently retired. And he just did a speaking tour in Australia and he's willing to come and do one here. So I think that there's an opportunity there because I've really found that uh, the messaging around green hospitals does resonate a lot with people and I think it's a way to get people on board. Great, um, very briefly in terms of the language when we're talking about climate change from a mental health perspective, um, uh, Carolyn Baker, a prominent eco-psychologist, advocates for us to use the term climate trauma to really give an understanding of the impacts for people's psychosocial well-being. So again, that's not necessarily looking at the positive aspects of what climate change means, but it is providing that uh, relationship between how it affects our mental health. Um, and going further in terms of our language, I think that we need to also consider it's not just hope, but it's active hope. It's pairing that emotional behavioral response mm. with action. So I think that those are two important terms that we can consider, especially in the mental health arena. And finally, just to address Dr. Chan's um, comments, um, yeah, I do feel for, you know, the average person who is struggling just to get by to put food on the table, who develop obesity because of the inadequate diets that we have. Um, the evidence uh, shows, as you're well aware, for example, if we do it at the policy level, um, having companies lower the sodium content of food is the ma major thing that's going to reduce hypertension. So I think for the average person, we have to work at the policy levels and get those into um, all our organizations, all our, our laws, uh, all the processes that would allow the uh, general public to, um, to have, for the, the impact of climate change to be mitigated by these policy changes. Great, so we just have, I think, three other, Ali, are you gonna ask a question? No, okay, go ahead, sir, and then uh, you. there, and then we'll get on. Thank, Thank you. you to everyone. Uh, my name is Patrick Close, I'm a prof at University of Montreal in uh, social sciences, but teaching uh, health and environment. Uh, it seems to me that it's well accepted that uh, climate change, environmental degradation, social inequalities, poverty, all the things we were talking about this morning, 
are linked to the system, the capitalistic or the neo neoliberal system we are living in. Uh, now, someone talked about uh, the social, the eco-social perspective, uh, which is a framework to look, to link the, uh, the environmental and the social questions together. Uh, and the different axes of that perspective is, for example, uh, the political engagement, uh, community participation, uh, the common good, solidarity, uh, durability, sustainability, etc. So my question is, do you have any ideas of, uh, on how to go from a capitalistic system to an, to an eco-social perspective? <laughs> <laughs> because well, maybe it's too long, but I think that to me, the bottom thing now is it's about social link, it's about solidarity, it's about common goods. I live since 20 years in Quebec, and now the population just elected a government that is not at all social and environmental uh, focused. So how do we do? Okay. Uh, sir? Hello, my name is uh, Charles Hadden. I'm a lawyer with an organization called Project. Could you speak a little louder, speak Charles? Sorry. sorry. I'm Charles Hadden. I'm a 